up open to the public and I can I remember uh, welcome the members to the meeting in the room today along with myself I have the vice chair Kelly Armstrong and also Andy Allen and on the phones we have Carol McKillum, Mark Durkin, Sinead Innes and Robin Newton and I know Fra and Johnny should be joining us um, as the meeting goes on. Um, can I then just uh, remind members who have dialed in, as well as members in the room, as well, of course, also about their telephone use, but especially members that have dialed in, um, again, just remind you to put your, your phones onto the mute button. It certainly does make a heck of a difference um, for everybody concerned. So I'll move on then to agenda item number one, which is apologies. Um, at this moment, I don't have apologies, though I do know from speaking to Johnny, um, uh, earlier on in the week that he will have to leave the meeting early today, so I do know that whenever he does join us. Um, agenda item number two is chairperson's business. Um, the only business I have for you this week is just to inform you that late on Friday evening um, I received a, uh, an email to ask would I go on to the politics show um, alongside Nora Smith from CO3 on Sunday. Um, so, and I was on it as, as chair of the committee and not as a DUP representative. So, um, albeit that it, uh, my complete weekend was a complete mess because of it, um, up until the show was over, and then it, the weekend was fine after that. So, it was just to inform members that that took place on Sunday morning. Um, move on then to agenda item number three, which is the draft minutes. Members, you'll find the draft minutes of last week's meeting, the 27th of May, at page six of your pack. Um, can I go to members in the room first? Are you content with those minutes as drafted in the room? Yeah? Yes. Then can I go to our members on the dial up? Sir? Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. You the room first. Go ahead, Sinead. No, it's just, it just doesn't uh, the minutes. It was uh, the question I asked the article in terms of whether they had made a formal written request to the Department for Economy or the job retention. I know we got um, information to us prior, or sorry. Um, after that meeting, the phone line was pretty bad, but that, that question is still like, standing at Okay, the phone line's really bad here at the minute, and you've just broken up the entire way through that, Sinead. Can I just ask you if you could just repeat that again for us, please? You're, is that better? Yep, that's slightly better, yep. Okay, so it was just in response to the question to the, the people from the Arts Council um, with regards to whether they had actually made a formal request to the Department for Economy um, about the job retention scheme. Yeah. So uh, that wasn't really answered at the meeting. And I know we got information since that meeting, but that wasn't um, included in any of the information that's been sent out since. So just so we can get a bit of clarity on that, that's, that's, that, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. We will we'll go back to them and ask for clarity on that. I know we certainly, as a committee, um, wrote to the, the Minister for the Economy, asking what more that she could do um, in line with that. Um, but I'll certainly uh, we'll get back to um, Nick Van CO3 and ask where they are with that. Absolutely. Yep, no problem. Okay, any other members on the phone? Anything from the draft minutes or are you all content to note? Uh, sorry, Chair. Go uh, ahead, just Mark. One, one wee thing. Uh, at the end of the meeting, or very near the end of it, I, I raised an issue that had been in the minutes from the previous uh, meeting, and that was following the presentation we had from officials and the Minister on the Housing Amendment Bill. Uh, there was a commitment undertaken uh, by the officials to write back with answers to some of the questions that had been raised that day, but uh, that isn't recorded in the minutes from last week's meeting, nor do I see a response in yet, so just if we could chase that up again, please. Yep, we'll do that, absolutely. So, um, members content then to carry on? Yeah, content? Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Carol. Um, just before we go into the presentation, can I just declare an interest as a former minister of DECAL, the Sport NI? Yeah, absolutely, Carol, no problem. We're just having a wee bit of sound trouble in here. I don't know what it's like for using the phones. Sean, could you maybe move that round slightly away from the microphone? Because I think it's... Yeah. Hiya, Johnny. Welcome. Hello. Is that any better? There's a lot of echo. A lot, yeah, there's a lot of background here as well. It's even round that way. As long as it's turned up a bit, Sean, we'll be all right to hear it. Okay, thank you. All right. Members, what about the site now? Is that any better for you? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, good. It's slightly better for us too. All right then, I'll move on then to agenda item number four, which is matters arising. Um, can I ask them members to go to page of 11 um, of their meeting packs where you'll find a response from the Minister of Finance on COVID-19 funding for councils and just remind members that the Minister for Communities will brief us further on this issue at next week's meeting on the 10th of June. So can I ask members, are they content to note that? Members in the room, yes. Members on the phone, yep. Yeah. Content, yeah. good stuff. I'll move then on to um, next item, which is a page 12. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, that's page 12. Yeah, page 12, which is a response from the Director of Parliamentary Services on the issue of teleconferencing at the committee meeting. I'll just update members and then I'll bring you in, Kelly. Um, at the CLG meeting yesterday that took place here, um, they're hoping that the Starleaf will be rolled out from next week. I did highlight it at the meeting yesterday that the sound quality of our meetings have been um, pretty poor sometimes and it's been very difficult. I know, especially, I know certainly for us in the room and I know some members have mentioned it to me on dial-in as well um, that we're not picking up maybe everything that witnesses are saying. So it's just to let you know that. And Kelly, you wanted to come in there? Yes, um, Chair, if I could. Um I know that I have been in contact each time, you know, when, when the committee has been very kind to say, are you attending in person or are you attending teleconference? And each time I have asked, it's not a, a particular, um, it, it, well, I suppose what I'm trying to say is it's extremely difficult for me, the response, because um, the reason why I've asked for better communications is because of my hearing. It's a reasonable adjustment for a disability. And while Starleaf is due to come along, in fact, after this meeting today, I'm hoping to test Starleaf with communications. I think that, um, it would be appropriate to point out to the Assembly that it's not just use of communications for remote working, it's actually for a disability adjustment. Um, and that's why I'm finding that quite difficult here that um, everything seems to be about broadcast and less about the people. And given the fact that this committee is the one that looks at disability, um, I find it a bit um, difficult to understand why reasonable adjustments can't be put in place for all committees. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, members on the uh, phone, phone, any comment on that? Uh, uh, Buffy here. Uh, no, I second with what Kelly, Kelly has said, because uh, it's difficult for, for some of us uh, that, that don't have any hearing issues. I'm sure it must be absolutely terrible for those that do. Um, so, so it supports uh, the committee in, in their efforts to try and get this sorted. Uh, I've listened in online to several other committees, and I don't believe, from what I'm hearing, uh, via their online streams that it is as bad as what the sound quality is with our meetings for whatever reason. Let's just put that on record and, and just on a slight point to the side of that, uh, the meeting packs today actually didn't come into my PDF reader at all. If they're not in my committee packs, it had to go to SharePoint and I was just wondering if any other members had that problem or was it just something wrong with my own tablet? Okay, I, I think it may have just been yours. Um, but we yeah, we'll, we'll just make sure. Um, and I suppose, I mean, committee members know that our committee packs are sent out on a Friday normally, and tabled items are usually at the very latest the day before. Um, so if members are at fine by the weekend, they haven't received um, their packs, certainly to get in contact with Sean, and that will be that will be rectified. So it's just to remind members of that because it could happen. These things happen, I suppose. Um, so just remind members and thanks for bringing that up as well, Johnny. Okay, then members, I'm going to move on then to the the third item on under this um, agenda item, and that you've been provided at page. 13, with the latest report from the examiner of statutory rules. Um, the examiner draws attention to rule two, to two rules rather, which relate in breach of the 21-day rule, but is content that the department has provided satisfactory explanation on this. Um, so can I ask members, um, therefore, are they content to note that? Content. Members on the phone content? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, members, that's that item agenda of business finished and we're going to now move on to our next item, uh, agenda item five, which is a briefing by Sport NI on the impact of COVID-19 on Northern Ireland's sports sector. Members have been provided with a briefing paper at page 23 of your pack and also um, note that a dash the dashboard referred to in paragraph 4.2 of the brief briefing paper can be found on page three 
of your tabled items. Um, so can I then therefore welcome Antoinette McKeown, the Chief Executive of Sport NI, and Colin Jennings, who's the Information Officer for Sport NI. Uh, can I ask you, Antoinette, and just say you're both very welcome, and ask you to uh, make your opening brief. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to um, come and brief the committee this afternoon on the work of the sports sector and Sport NI in particular in response to COVID-19. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, I don't intend bringing members through the entire brief, just a few opening remarks, and I'm happy to take any questions, queries or comments that um, committee members have and, and spend most of the time in answering those queries. I think it's a better use of time. First of all, I want to say that um, sport um, was one of the first hit sectors um, by COVID-19 um, and was one of the first closures that we saw um, and has therefore been impacted for the longest period with some real consequences and um, which sport and I are, um, are, are, are seeing and continue to see. Um, I want to commend the sports sector um, for showing real leadership um, at, in terms of compliance with um, the safety uh, messages. And in fact, we had worked closely in Sport and I with the Chief Medical Officer and the Public Health Agency in terms of getting those safe messages out um, across um, the entire sporting community. Um, but the sports sector has actually reallocated um, their volunteers in um, support to getting medical supplies and food to vulnerable people who have been isolating as a result of COVID-19. And many sports clubs have shown a real effort um, of, lo of local support and aid in their local communities. And the sporting community we recognise as one of the key communities that the Northern Ireland Executive will rightly look to um, to return um, us to a new, healthy and active um, normality and normal society. And Sport and I recognise that it, survival and building resilience is critical at that, this time to enable sports to play that vital role to return us. Of course, Sport and I and the entire sporting sector recognises the need for clear priority of resources um, to go to our frontline services and we continue to actively support um, that work. Um, Sport and I continues to um, lead um, the sector and to work very closely with the sector in response to COVID-19 and our paper sets out, um, of course, the long-term um, impacts, both the immediate impacts and long-term impacts of COVID-19 but also some of the responses that were make, made to the Sports Hardship Fund in partnership with um, the Department for Communities, um, the, um, the, the Sport Wellbeing Hub, which we've launched, the resumption of um, sport um, framework that we um, developed to, to guide sports um, towards um, a resumption of sport um, and a phase three funding um, package of support that we are um, currently working on. So rather than go into detail on all of those, I'm assuming that um, members will have had a chance to read the brief. I'm happy to take any questions or queries that there are. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Antoinette. And um, again, you, uh, I want to just put in the record um, you know how grateful I, I am certainly to those sporting organisations, not only within my own constituency but right across the country, um, who have stepped up to the mark during this pandemic, who have, as you say, have, have, have done things differently in order to help those people within their communities um, at, their, at the time of most need. So if you could pass on our thanks as well um, to those sporting organisations um, for, for absolutely stepping up to the mark. Um, we, as you'd know, as you probably would know, uh, Antoinette, we have had several briefings over the past few weeks. Um, we've had from Solace, from the Arts Council, and from the, the voluntary community sector, who, who were who set a figure of, of what they would require going forward um, in order to to um, make sure that the, their sector is sustained. Um, would you have a figure at all of what um, the sporting sector um, would would need? In order to, to keep it going um, in the in the sort of the weeks and months ahead, that's my first question. And then, if you could just um, expand a wee bit on the sports hub as well, and and also on how you see sport coming back um, in the future when you look at social distancing and things like that. If you could just on those three issues, first of all. Okay. Thank you, Chair. 
I think uh, um, currently we are working on a means by which to quantify the amount of funding that would be required to return sports. And it's um, particularly problematic when we don't yet have a date of return um, to some of our big sports. Um, for example, um, returning to um, to professional rugby, um, for us to rugby, um, to return um, for our um, Northern Ireland Football League, to return for our um, GA County um, clubs to return. Um, it, it represents a huge amount of money in the absence of a, of a date for return. What we do know is that, for example, um, the um, Ulster GA Championship um, not going ahead this season will, will cost um, the Ulster GA approximately £22 million. Pounds. We also know that the IFA um, is a salaried organisation. It brings in a considerable amount of money to the Northern Ireland economy on an annual basis, but it also has a wage bill of £3 million. Pounds, um, and um, that, is, that is particularly problematic when you don't have any gate receipts um, as a result of, of games um, not happening. So Sport and I is working to quantify that at the minute, but this is right across 84 governing bodies of sport where they've had to cancel competitions and um, so the the income from those events and um, loss of third party um, investment through sponsorship and um, loss of the volunteer workforce which is i mean one that for club alone has identified their volunteer workforce as worth a million pounds a year so it's incredibly difficult to put um, um, a price on it sport and i is um opening a um, national lottery um, fund at the end of June. We have currently put, our board has approved a £3 million um, price tag on that, but we know that we will be very, very heavily oversubscribed to that. But we are working with our Department for um, Communities colleagues to see if we can put um, a bid into the June monitoring round for additional funding um, to support the return to sport, but also the new ways of working. And then just about the, 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 the promotion of the, the NI Wellbeing Hub. Yes, thank you, Chair. No, you're um, and in, in terms of the um, in terms of the, the wellbeing hub, Sport and I has been working for some considerable time now. Um, we lead in terms of mental health and wellbeing in sport. We lead a multidisciplinary forum of mental health and sport, which, which comprises a whole range of sporting organisations and mental health organisations. We've brought those skills together um, to actually address um, mental health um, in, across our sports in Northern Ireland, which, of course, we recognise Northern Ireland has the highest levels of ill mental health um, in the United Kingdom, and our sporting community reflects our, um, our wider community. Sport and I, more recently, as a result of the outbreak of COVID-19, we moved to Fast Track, um, an online resource that we had been working on in partnership with Inspire Mental Health, one of our leading charities here. And we have fast tracked it and put it um, out right across the sporting community. In fact, it's available to, um, to everyone in Northern Ireland. Um, it provides some really strong online resources to track your mood, to actually um, give you signposting to more professional services. And we've also, not just have we put the um, online resource in place, we've also been delivering um, training and mental health awareness, and we have actively um, taken a partnership with the Northern Ireland Football League um, to provide support to coaches, managers and players um, during um, COVID-19. So we've been doing a considerable amount of work on that because we all recognise, we've, we've seen the news reports, how um, mental health charities have been inundated since the start of COVID-19 and recent research by Queen's University is saying that it's likely to get um, to get worse so Sport and I want to provide some level of support um, to our communities <coughs> as we work through COVID-19 and the impact it's having um, on our mental health. No, and that, that's really positive and that's good news to hear that because we know, um, especially, especially within the, the sporting fraternity and the amount of very much male-dominated sports 
um, where where quite often men don't talk about these things. So I mean, it is good that you're 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 taking the lead there and being proactive there. So well done on that. Um, yep. I'm really glad that you raised the issue of um, men don't, um, without wishing to stereotype men. Um, men, you know, generally don't um, don't talk about their mental health um, condition and their emotions. But we have deliberately targeted some really high profile um, sporting heroes, male sporting heroes, who have themselves. Um, made videos on behalf of Sport and I on their own journey with ill mental health, and we have had um, we've had over a hundred thousand um, hits on our social media in uh, looking at those videos and, and responding to them. And we have a number of high-profile um, mental health sporting ambassadors, including Ashley McConville, who um, who's who ha- is uh, um, who had an addiction in terms of gambling and Paddy Barnes, who had a similar problem. We've also used a whole range of um, sporting heroes to deliver that message of ask, listen, talk. Um, And we have um, got a partnership with Sporting Chance, um, which is headed by Tony Adams, um, ex-premiership football player. Um, For those who actually do need that level of support, we can get access to the Sporting Chance Clinic to enable recovery in, in that field. No, well done, and we know around, especially at this time with COVID-19, the levels of, of poor mental health are on the increase and will continue to increase as we as we come out of this pandemic as well, so um, well done on that. Um, I just want to move then just to ask a couple of questions to do with the, uh, the Sports Hardship Fund, um, and then I'll bring members in, and thank you for sending us along the dashboard. Um, that's been extremely useful in explaining to us just um, where everything went to. And I mean, I know when I first looked at it, I thought, yep, that it mean that's what I w- would have expected. Um, looking at the dashboard, um, and it's just a couple of questions around that, and it's more to do with the application process rather than where the money went to and um, um, who it went to. Which, uh, as I said, that's what I would have expected. Um, very much so, given the the level of sports here in Northern Ireland. Um, th- we know that there's been problems with this, um, and we know that it had to that it had to close early, um, because of the over uh, oversubscription, which is it is fair enough. We knew that there was going to be a massive amount given, as you say, all of those uh, issues with sports clubs having to close down and their loss of income and everything else. Um, and we know that they've been doing a lot of good work through through the COVID-19. But it's just how it was done. I, I just can't get my head around it, why it was closed at, at the stage it was closed and wasn't left open for all of those um, people to apply. Because we know, and I would expect, certainly within... Um, the Gaelic sports and the association football. There will be a lot of people who work um, within within those bodies who are well used to completing um, grant applications. Um, some of them are, are paid to do that, and that, that's fine. That's perfectly right, and that's that's great. And there are other groups there that we know are made up of could be your local bowling club or or squash club or whatever that might be, or made up of volunteers who maybe aren't so savvy. So it's just the understanding and the rationale behind opening up a hardship fund and then closing it down before everyone was able to get an application form in and then looking at those applications in the round of which were the most at need or was it based on first come first serve basis and I suppose it's get it's just really asking that why was it done that way if it was done that way was it based on first come first serve or was it looking at, at actual need amongst all of those um, sporting Clubs, uh, you know, if you could just explain that to me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Sport and I are uh, the first to recognise the frustration out there and across the sporting community um, that within 48 hours of opening uh, an emergency fund, we had to um, close it. Um, we, we do recognise the frustration, but we also recognise the demand and the need out there. Um, from um, the very clubs who are actually um, so active in our communities and keeping um, the vulnerable people in our our, our communities safe at the minute. Um, And that's also been a a source of frustration to us as well. We did open the fund with half um, a million, uh, anticipating that more money may have become available. um, And 
unfortunately, um, 48 hours after we opened, we got confirmation from the Department for Communities that the, at that time there was no additional funding made available. We opened the emergency fund not on a um, to give two thousand pounds to everyone every sports club who applied who was eligible, not on an objective need. We didn't have any waiting in respect of disadvantaged communities. This was an emergency response um, to get those clubs who were really, really struggling um, to survive um, to actually um, give them give them a little bit of support. So that's that's what um, that's what the core objective of the fund um, was. Um, I think one of the issues for me, in particular um, as an accounting officer, to have continued to keep that fund open when we had surpassed the amount of money in the budget to deal with that would have been really poor governance practice, and we would have been um, potentially committing ourselves to um, funding that wasn't public funding that wasn't available. That's the first thing. We were also very conscious that to to distract local clubs. Um, um, from their volunteering work and from their attempts to uh, at survival, um, to distract them from filling in um, applications, even though it was a very simple online application. At a time when we knew we had no money, we felt it was unfair and potentially disingenuous. So, having discussed it with the department and the minister, we took the very difficult decision of actually um, suspending any new applications to the fund. However, we have identified additional funding um, of up to 750000 We're waiting for the business case um, to go through at the minute, um, but it will deal with all applications in the system. And we've also worked very closely with our Department for Economy um, colleagues um, in actually opening up grants that were not previously um, um, accessible by the sports community and what we've done is for those clubs who've been eligible for our fund and also find themselves eligible for a DFE um, scheme, we've actually discussed with them and removed them from the sports hardship fund to give more money um, to those people who haven't, to those clubs and sport, um, sporting organisations who haven't had access to any form of support. So we do recognise, we do recognise the frustration. Okay, and thank you for that. And it, it, it's good to know that there there is future money there that will be um, used. Uh, only thing that concerns me about that is you did say that all applications that are in the system. So what about the applications that didn't get into the system because it closed, or uh, you know, are there? Are, do you do you feel that there are going to be a cohort of groups and sporting organisations who? weren't lucky enough to get into the system before it closed that are going to miss out here as well. Just your your your, your advice on that. Chair, I, I, uh, unfortunately, um, there will be a number of um, sporting clubs who will need access to that £2,000 grant who have not been able to get their application into the system. We can't, we, we can't open the system, um, the application system again, because we don't actually have the um, funding available. We're exhausting the additional money put in. We're putting it in to honour those who have taken the time to submit their applications, but we don't have any additional funding, though we, we are continuing to seek that additional funding from the Northern Ireland Executive um, to enable all those who need a very small £2,000 grant to enable to survive, that those clubs actually have access to that. Yeah, and, and, and that, I suppose, is disappointing as well. And we're not saying that this is in any way your fault, the amount of money, because it's not. Um, but, it, you know, it is disappointing that there are clubs out there. It, it, tell me, just Antoinette, whenever this went live, was there a closing date put on it? No, there wasn't a closing date put on it. Um, and and I, I, we did not anticipate having to close it within 48 hours, but we felt we didn't, in terms of good governance and it being the right thing to do with integrity, we felt we had no choice, and our department colleagues and our minister agreed with that. Okay. <laughs> No, I, under, I absolutely understand where you're coming from. I just, I just fear that there are a lot of clubs now that are going to miss out because they were, their application wasn't in the system. But look, I'm going to open it up to members now. Um, uh, I don't want to get accused of hogging all the questions like I did last week. So I'll open it up to members. I'm going to go to members on the phone first for this briefing, and then the next briefing it will be the opposite way around. So I'm going to the telephones first, and I'm going to go to Sinead, you first, if you're there. Sinead? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, thanks to uh, and an Esther for uh, for sending us through all the information. Um, there. Well, look, I just want to echo what what Anthony said in terms of um, the local community response to COVID, which was very much spearheaded by the local sports club. Uh, was, you know, often they are a part of community, so you know it's only enough. It's only so they would be they would be the first on hand to respond to COVID. So just to put on record, my thanks and my to all those volunteers from the sports club and um, throughout the right up um, to use the risk away the time of COVID. I think, first of all, I think, I think, uh, I think, 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 one of the reasons why, I mean, it's only one of the reasons why they were, they were asked here today to give us a uh, conversation about the, the COVID response and the sports um, system. Um, because one of the reasons they were asked uh, it's like is it some um in the chamber around how funds was administered and soon. So I think we need to just you know, I think it's very important that we uh, we, we need to dispel outright any kind of version uh, of some sports are given any kind of preferential treatment and um, through the, the administration of this fund, of this uh fund. You know, and I'm sure Antoinette and Colin would be very keen to do that as well. Uh, the criteria was very, 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 very uh, that this was for and maintenance um, in terms of rent and facilities. So, of course, uh, that was staff not the clubs that own their own facilities, um, as opposed to clubs that uh, rent or lease the facilities from, from the likes of local councils. So, you know, I, I just want, you know, I'd like to hear from, from and um, her assessment uh, on, on that, on, on that, be that heard in the last, uh, the last couple of weeks about whether there was any treatment given to the administration. I'm sure Sport and I very keen to, to spell that. Antoinette, did you get all of that? Um, I, I think I got, um, I don't think I got all of it, but I got, I got key, um, I got key elements in terms of um, Sinead um, welcoming the work of local clubs who are, are at the heart of communities and in particular the volunteer effort. Um, I want to confirm what Sinead, I believe, has asked in respect of recent media attention um, on the Sports Hardship Fund and to confirm that um, we had a very transparent, fair process of um, application, as we always do. In fact, this was a very much an open fund where um, anyone who met very a very short criteria would actually get £2,000, and we did that deliberately so that we could get, um, because this was an emergency fund, a hardship fund, we wanted to do that um, to get the um, money out as quickly as possible. If you look at if you look at sports across the piece, the largest participation sport in Northern Ireland is Gaelic sports, followed very quickly by association football, so we would expect there to be um, high volumes from because they, they um, dominate um, the number of clubs we have. Those sports, for example, also, um, as Sinead has said, I, I will confirm that they um, are um, clubs that hold, um, or they are governing bodies in sports which hold um, the, the biggest number of premises. So it, the, the overall and chart um, or, um, that's um, been provided um, in respect of um, where the funding has gone is reflective of where sports are in Northern Ireland. Sinead? Yeah, th thanks very much. That's, I know and I'm sure I talked to Buckley will take from us, but I know John made commentary to the chamber around uh, quite alarmed that the court. Uh, Sorry, you Sinead, you're, you're breaking up terribly almost, so you are. Um, I know the, the trouble with rural broadband and all of that, um, but just sure. just say that again, yeah. Sinead. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I'll try again. So, yeah, so, yeah, like John, probably Jonathan Buckley had made a, a comment in the year around um, his figure of, of 40% of, of um, applicants to the Successful applicants to the fund were from uh, GAA clubs, but 
when I look at the, the dashboard that's sent through, I can see here um, the figure is thirty percent. But I wonder if the next uh, could just confirm whether that's a recent figure and what what actually is the most updated figure in terms of um, the percentage of successful applications um, from not just the from football and, and multi sports as well. Yeah, um, th this is the most up to date um, dashboard. We update it every Friday after um, every Friday afternoon, and as we work through um, transferring some of the applications in the system over to um, DFE um, funding, as we actually, if the business case um, for the additional amount um, comes through and is successful, we this will um, inevitably change as we work through the adjustments that we're making currently. Um, if it's helpful, um, and we've had this conversation with our departmental colleagues, we're happy to we're happy to publish this um, every Friday evening um, on our website, so that there is absolute transparency um, in terms of um, the number of applications and um, applications successful by sport, um, because we want to make sure that we're able to um, we're able to demonstrate um, on an ongoing basis a really good use of public money. Sinead, do you want to come back again? Yeah, no, that, that would be helpful um, because it's, it's my understanding that those, um, those figures are high or even high. Um, as you said, the number of um, applications maybe apply to a, a different type of fund, but those just, just to finish up, go and hold the, the meeting. But um, please, for um, the papers we were sent through, please, for um, through development of the process. I'm just want, I'm just maybe like I said, I want to hold things like to get a wee bit more information of what exactly that yields um, and whether there's any opportunities for um, uh, for clubs in terms of revitalisation um, and stimulus, you know, post COVID. But as I said, we do receive that um, other members are looking in. Okay, Chair, I'm sorry, I didn't hear if there was a question there. No. I didn't hear it. Apologies. Uh, Sinead, we're, you're, we're, you're, your line is extremely, extremely bad. If you want to email and send any of that through, um, we'll certainly pick it up. So we will, if that's if, oh. if we can do that. Is that all right? Okay, 100%. No bother. Thank you, Sinead. Um, I'm going to go then on to Johnny. Go ahead, Johnny. Thank you, sir, and thank you for the presentation from Sport NI. Firstly, I suppose I would like to place on record uh, my thanks and appreciation to all of the sporting clubs across Northern Ireland who have done fantastic work uh, in the middle of this COVID crisis, supporting communities, whether that be from local GAA clubs, supporting communities, to tennis clubs, football clubs, they've all, uh, right across the sector, really put their shoulder behind the way to help their communities through what is a very difficult time. Um, much has been mentioned with regards to the Sport Hardship Fund, and I think I would need to address some of these points in particular given that I had some concern, which I raised with the Minister in the Chamber, I think, some two weeks ago. I didn't catch all of what Sinead Ennis had said, but in relation to the particular comments that I made, those were based upon a written answer by the Minister to Sammy Wilson MP, which at the time reflected the figures proportionately in terms of funding allocated. The table that is before us here today is obviously a live snapshot of where things are at present, so, therefore, they will be different to that particular question that I asked. I have to say, I do have real concern regarding the administration of the Sport Hardship Fund, uh, and, and I do take issue with some comments that were said in relation to how it has been administered by Sport NI. It's been mentioned about being transparent for uh, process. And as you already mentioned, a scheme that closed within two days due to oversubscription, and we always knew that that was going to be the case, so I, I take uh, refuge at the comment that we, we didn't realise there would be such a demand. There was such an expectation among sports clubs that in a time of crisis like this that they would receive uh, adequate uh, assistance from the department to help them through the hardship. And point two, two of the programme's objective that talks about uh, the programme development has been undertaken with the intention to make emergency hardship payments to those sports clubs and sporting organisations in greatest need as quickly as possible. But as the Chair has mentioned, how can we in two days establish 
who is in greatest need. It's probably most likely in those sporting clubs that have not had the ability to apply for the fund because they're operating on a volunteer type basis and are in most need of the funding but have not got around to accessing it. So I would like uh, some comment uh, around that. Um, the scheme closed within two days and I, I, I personally knew that we were going to have a very heavy subscription in terms of the need that was out there. Uh, but I would like to hear further comment from Sport and I why they feel that that was an acceptable process. And if so, what prior conversations did the organisation have with all sporting sectors to make them aware of the need to get in straight away in this scheme on what seems to be a first come, first serve basis? Go ahead, Anstead. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Jonathan. What, what I would say first and foremost is that. Um, all sports received a statement at the same time in respect of the hardship fund. Um, so everyone had the same information at the same time. We had actually had a meeting with um, offered to all governing bodies across um, um, across sport in Northern Ireland and had um, facilitated that with three meetings. Um, so that um, we didn't have 84 sports online at the same time and people had an opportunity to ask what questions were needed. We had also sent out, uh, we had sent out um, a financial impact of COVID-19 um, table and many, many um, sporting bodies um, filled that in, governing bodies of sport um, completed that and we find obviously of no surprise to hear that there were um, very similar um, challenges um, on financial impact across the sport. Um, what I would also say is that um, I, I do believe that the hardship fund was transparent and was fair because the same the criteria was set before we opened. Everyone was advised at the same time that uh, um, that it was going to to be opened. Um, there was um, there was fairness because, the, as I said, the eligibility criteria was 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 applied um, to every single application that came in. We did recognise that demand was actually going to be high, and we anticipated having more than 500,000. And I think that was the critical that was the critical issue that when we went to draw down further monies um, from the Northern Ireland Executive pot um, to respond to COVID-19, and um, there was no money in that pot. So that's actually nobody's fault. Sport and I recognise that at that time and the frontline services um, were getting um, the bulk of the funding and that was absolutely right. Um, so if we don't have any money, we can't keep the fund um, we can't keep a fund open, but we didn't at the time of opening it anticipate that there would be no money um, and three days later. And that was the issue. It wasn't anticipating the demand, but anticipating no further money to the 500,000. And hence, Sport and I has actually reviewed our budget and found an additional 750,000 of money this year. Um, and I want to say a huge thank you. And now that I have the opportunity to district councils across Northern Ireland who supported Sport and I um, in the majority, supported Sport and I in reallocating monies that we would normally allocate to them for them to use in their local communities, sporting communities. Um, that they enabled that, that £500,000 worth of money to be reallocated to the Sports Hardship Fund. Um, and that's where we find the bulk of the money in recognition that we needed to respond to the demand out there. I, I do have, uh, again, want to reiterate considerable concern around the design of the scheme. Uh, if we look at the table in front of us, then much will be said on the headline figures, but if we really drill into them, it's about a question about proportionality. And if, if we look at them, it shows that, and I'm picking uh, the GAA out here on this because of the fact that they are leading the table in terms of uh, funding allocated, and uh, that's sure. not, in, not the, nothing in relation to recognising the number of GAA clubs, etc., as there is across Northern Ireland, but proportionality. Of the 30% of applications made were by the GAA, they have received 36% of the allocated funding. And I, I would beg me to ask the question, and I have put this to the Minister, but I'm going to ask Sport NI directly. <clears throat> what a quality impact assessment was carried out in the design of this hardship fund for sports clubs to ensure that all sporting sectors were equally represented in the funding, funding allocated? 
Well, I suppose the first thing that I would say is that the quality impact assessment is not about equal representation. It's about um, making sure that there is equality of opportunity and that where that doesn't happen, there's um, there's mitigating um, there, there's mitigating actions or, or decisions taken. Um, we don't apply a, a, a poll approach to um, our proportion, proportionality. It's about um, ensuring that inequalities are actually um, taken out of the uh, of the programme. Sport and I has an entire programme of response to um, to COVID-19 and set out in the paper of um, phases one to four, plus the resumption of sport, plus a whole range of services. Um, that we are offering training and development webinars, mental health um, support that we are offering um, across um, all of the sporting um, sectors, um, mental health, um, most of the resources at the minute and that um, in terms of direct um, support is going to um, the Northern I Irish Football League and, and therefore um, IFA clubs. So. Um, there's been a whole programme of activity which is yeah. currently being subject um, to equality impact assessment ahead of a board meeting next Wednesday evening, J Jonathan. So that's, so, so, that's where yeah, we so, are in respect of that. So how do you ensure, you mentioned the word equality of opportunity as opposed to, so how do you ensure equality of opportunity to a scheme that closes within two days that probably hasn't uh, taken into consideration clubs that are probably in the greatest need that haven't had a chance to apply because the chair mentioned earlier, and I think it was a very valid point and something that will be uh, sad and it will come as a great state of shock and sadness to many clubs that of the additional funds that you've found, and I welcome that, I support additional money for this here, uh, I, I certainly do because I think it's, it's key that we try to get more money to those sport clubs, but of the additional 750,000 that, that you potentially will be allocating, that those that weren't in within the two days still will not be able to uh, apply or access any of this funding. And that causes me great concern to, to put in place equality of opportunity. Well, um, and I look, Jonathan, I totally agree and sympathise with what you're saying. As I've said, the equality impact assessment is across the entire um, programme. Um, I think if you're looking, and, and, and I want to be clear that this is not about proportionality, um, but if you do look at the number, um, the number of applications received across the sports, with the exception of rugby um, union, because rugby union, and I want to again commend rugby's leadership in providing half a million pound of their own money from the sport into their clubs, um, which is why we didn't see uh, 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 more applications um, from rugby union. But it does broadly um, reflect where clubs and clubs with facilities are um, across Northern Ireland um, in, in general. I'm not saying very specifically in general. I think the other issue is that we totally sympathise um, with the sports. We agree that um, it's very, very difficult when we open a <coughs> fund and have to close it 48 hours later. But that decision was taken, and I will stand over as accounting officer because I'm not going to spend money that we don't have in a budget. But there's one very clear means of addressing this, um, and that is to have the committee write to Northern Ireland Executive and seek further funding for those clubs. Um, I believe very, very strongly that it's, it's these clubs who, as Sinead said, are at the heart of our communities who will help Northern Ireland recover from COVID-19 and keep us fit, keep us active, keep us healthy in our local communities because social distancing um, and restricted travel is not going away for a considerable period of time. So, Jonathan, there's a real opportunity for the committee to support um, more money into the hardship fund. And I think the final thing that I would say is because this was an emergency fund, £2,000 to everyone, every club who is eligible for it, and I think 2.4 um, sets out the eligibility criteria. The eligibility criteria did not include um, any form of waiting because we simply <coughs> couldn't have done it without considerable more work and considerable more time. Um, it didn't have a criteria around areas of greatest need or organisations um, who could actually demonstrate that they had more of a claim on the equality element than others. Um, and that's, that was not part of the specific eligibility criteria. 
Uh, and just in closing, Chair, look, I accept what you're saying on, on that point, but I think it's a matter of regret that time was not included into the eligibility criteria because I think it would have been a fair system to allow all of those clubs in need to apply into the system and then a judgment call to be made uh, on an equality of opportunity basis to ensure that we have a fair proportional representation of support packages across all sporting sectors. Uh, on that point, Chair, I'm happy to hand over to the next speaker. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. I'll go then to Carol. Carol, can you hear me? Yes, sorry, just taking a new button off. Um, okay. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, okay. I felt that the details that we have provided were of the standards that I would like to have seen from others who have came in front of the committee. So I want to say well done on that. Thank you. Um, I do believe the issue around the hardship fund is something that you're probably a victim of your own success. And I admire your plea to get us to write the executive to give you more money. Um, but the issue for me, um, Antoinette, and I suppose her colleagues on the committee, I, as a previous minister, I, I don't want this committee to be down the route of GEA first soccer. Um, I think it's bad. Yeah. So um, if there are additional funds that can be put in and people can avail them, whatever, particip whatever participation there is in sport, regardless what that code is or what it looks like, we should welcome that. I just believe that, you know, it sends out the wrong message. And the, co the collaboration between soccer and rugby and daily games has been carefully nurtured and carefully crafted and sustained well beyond any funding mechanisms or arrangements. And the last thing that they would want is sort of the commentary around um, criticism of the GAA because it just didn't look right. Now, I appreciate, I appreciate the point that the many clubs and areas will lobby their MLAs, and given the geography and given the, the political complexion, you will get, you'll always get a, a bigger lobby from some sports and others, and you'll also get a lobby from some of the the, the clubs at grassroots level, you aren't as well organised as others, and I think we need to factor that in in any future consideration of funds. Because of you, you have rightly pointed out that when it came to this crisis, it was the groups at grassroots level who were out with their friends and their neighbours and their families, and they were helping people who were really vulnerable. And I believe those relationships will stand us all in good stead well beyond COVID. So we would, I think the committee would like to see more um, funding getting into health grassroots sporting clubs. I think we would like that, and I'm asking to ensure that there's a gender balance in all this as well, because some of the big sports are male focused. And uh, I would like to see, when we're looking at uh, quality of opportunity and the quality of impact, that the gender balance is addressed as well by the, the sporting group. And I also want to commend you on your mental health champions because having those ambassadors and advocates for better mental health, I know personally from experience, has actually touched people who are really vulnerable, particularly young men, but not exclusively. So well done on that. And if there are any opportunities to even look at, you know, a bit more of an impact on that and hard crosses over with health and are we all under suicide prevention can perhaps get us a bit more support, then that's the sort of thing that I would really like to see a bit more information on when it's possible. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Carol. Um, there was no question there, sure there wasn't. That was, or, uh, Antoinette, do you want to make any comment on what Carol said? Yeah, just um, thank you, Chair. Just to say thank you, Carl, for um, for that support and the the commentary um, that you made. I absolutely 
totally agree with you in respect of um, ensuring that women in sports get an equal profile as we move into this brave new new world post COVID nineteen. There are huge opportunities and new ways of working, um, that um, we need to actually have inclusion front and centre. And Sport and ICU corporates plan, which is currently with the department for approval prior to consultation, actually has a cornerstone of equality and inclusion. Um, women, women in sport, um, and actually working um, in, in deprived communities. Um, so, and there will be waiting on a new corporate plan on that, which I hope um, Jonathan will, will, will show um, show you our commitment um, to that. So, um, it, it is a key element of, of going forward. I also agree that it's, it's, it was a very conscious decision for us to look for sporting ambassadors from among our own sporting heroes in Northern Ireland, and we have heard feedback. Um, from those sporting ambassadors that are telling us that they have had a considerable amount of young men and women who have come forward to say as a result of your video, I am now seeking help. I have had the courage to lift the phone and say I need support. And if we can do that to only one young sports person, then that will have made all of our effort worthwhile. And this is something that we want to grow. I agree, Carl, we, need to, we want to find a way of... Um, of, of measuring the impact, but the impact of our of our pilot project on um, well-being and sport has been a huge success, and I'm happy to make that available to the committee if, for those of you who want further information on it. Okay, thank you, Antoinette. Um, I'll move on then, and I'll go to Mark. Mark, are you there? Oh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you to the team there for the presentation. I suppose I, I'd like to concur with much of what Carl has said and I suppose pay particular tribute to the, the, the role played by many sporting clubs and organisations through this uh, COVID crisis and note the important role that sport has to play as we emerge from it in terms of helping people sort of reintegrate and, and bring in all the positive benefits that we know that sport does bring for people's physical and, and mental health. As regards to sports hardship fund and some of the criticism, shall we say, or scrutiny of it there that, that we've heard thus far uh, today, it seems to be a case that you can't do right for doing wrong. It's hard to think of any of the many uh, support schemes brought forward by various ministers in various uh, departments, all well-intentioned and all gratefully received by many, but, the, but it's, it's hard to find any that, that haven't had flaws. And, and holes in them that people have fallen through. In, instance, in the instance of the Sports Hardship Fund, I mean, you've actually taken positive steps, in my uh, opinion, to reduce the bureaucratic burden, not, not just on, yeah. on yourselves or on the department, but on the clubs th th themselves uh, to, to apply for. And it's great that you have identified this additional £700,000 <coughs> that will cover the other uh, teams or clubs in the system. Uh, you took the words right out of my mouth in terms of us writing to the executive to ask for more money for those clubs that haven't or it looks like won't receive any assistance at all. But I was just want, and if that needs a proposal, uh, I'm certainly happy to make that proposal, Chair, that we do do that. But I'd like to have a wee bit more detail around it. Have Sport and I, from your databases of the, the knowledge that you have at your disposal, are you able to say how many organisations that might apply to, how much we might be seeking? Um, well, because we close... Sorry, Chair, are you happy that I answer? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Th thank you. Um, thank you, Mark, um, for that. Um, we know that we have up to 4,000 clubs um, across Northern Ireland, and we know that the Northern Ireland Executive won't have the funding to give £2,000 to every one of those. Um, and we know what we know, we believe that with the additional money that we've made um, made available, that we will be able to address all of the need within our system. If we were to open again, um, I um, I couldn't put a figure on it because we haven't um, information through the system. But I think we're probably looking if we want to um, address those who haven't received funding from anywhere else. Um, I think you're possibly looking at another two million pounds, but that's that's a guesstimate, Mark. We would need to do a bit of additional um, work around that to give you a specific figure. 
No, I, I appreciate that. But, uh, thank you and, and thanks for the presentation and, and the good work and the stuff on mental health, as Carl has said, has, has been great as well. Thank okay. you. Okay, Mark, thank you. I'll move on then to Robin. Robin, are you there? Thank you, Chair. And uh, welcome the delegation to the... I suppose I, I don't want to... I don't have a specific question, Chair, um, really just to say that I recognise uh, what others ha have said about the role that sport has to play in our community in general. And indeed, as we get back to whatever might be regarded as normal after this pa pandemic, I do. Uh, I think, Annette, uh, you do need to address. You'll be familiar with that old adage: justice must not only be done, but it must be seen to be done. And uh, there are obviously uh, groups out there in the community who need to be convinced uh, when an application process is uh, put in place. Um, that it is open, transparent, fair, and so on. Uh, but I do think the, the last two uh, lines uh, of uh, the information you've put uh, to us really sum up everything. Clubs are at the heart of our communities, and it's vital also that sport is protected. And I think those are the two adages that should take us forward uh, into uh, our return to normal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Robin, for that. Um, Fra, can I go to you? You there? Yeah, Chair, sure. thank you very much. And uh, thank you for letting me in. And I want to uh, thank uh, Antoinette for the presentation. I think the graphics and the other information supplied is excellent. That uh, clearly lays out uh, the, 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 the trend of where the, the, the resources went. I know I live in a community that uh, where the, the, the GAA, the local club, may have 13, 14 teams. Uh, many of them are out in the streets every day. Uh, the local soccer team uh, has about seven or eight teams. They're in the streets every day. Uh, they're doing what they can for their local community, and, and they need to be commended. And uh, I, I do believe uh, Carl has Carl has asked uh, 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 most, most of the stuff that I would have uh, said, but. It would have been far better, I believe, if Jonathan had came along with this thing, recognizing the difficulty uh, and trying to allocate the limited amount of funding that there is, rather than just uh, choose one element of sports, which is the GAA. Uh, I think that we, we have to commend all sports for the work that they do. I think we have to recognize that there's a limited amount of funding, and I have no doubt that I'm sure that will come in is that if additional funding comes along, then they will be able to target that on a far better basis and encourage people to, to, to come in. But I have no doubt that people are waiting in anticipation to participate uh, in applications uh, for, for, for this fund. Uh, it's not an easy job, and I know that people think. So rather than just choose out what Jonathan has done, uh, the GAA, it would be much better uh, arguing the point uh, that as a committee, that we argue for additional funds to what everybody has looked after in the present time. Okay, thank you for that, Fra. Um, uh, I don't know, was there a question for Antoinette in that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was just the, 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 the point about the additional funding yeah. again. Yeah. And uh, is, this, uh, is Sport MI uh, working with clubs uh, that were unfortunate enough not to get, uh, I know that in, in terms of uh, when I was in Delphi City Council, we started up uh, support for sport and how difficult it can be uh, to, to an unlimited budget to think. But will, will they be working with clubs that, that, that don't get or haven't got? Okay, Antoinette. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. And if I may come back on, on Robin's, um, what, Robin's comments as well. Um, thank you. But... Um, thank you. Fra, just to say that, um, and again, Jonathan, um, you'll be interested to hear this, that just on Monday afternoon when we were finalising um, some current thinking around our new um, National Lottery Fund, is that we, we had a really good discussion around how we actually balance 
getting the money out the door quickly um, to enable um, survival and resilience building as soon as possible um, to those clubs and, and governing bodies who are um, who are eligible to receive the money. How we actually balance that with the um, targeting um, communities and clubs and governing bodies in areas of greatest um, social need and also looking at um, the, um, the equality and inclusion agenda as well. So that's something that we're very, very conscious of um, because we've had a little more time and because the focus of our new um, Phase 3 um, fund, and of course this still has to be uh, approved by our board, but our proposed focus is around resilience, um, bringing in innovation as we move to a, a return to sport and capturing what's been really the, the good bits about how we've managed to adapt um, and um, the resilience building, the survival um, and the resumption of sports. So there's a slightly different focus to our hardship fund, which is why we're still pushing for additional funding coming into um, the hardship fund. Um, and just in terms then of um, what Robin has said, I totally agree, Robin, with what you said in relation to where, you know, what is actually the most fundamental issue here in terms of um, clubs at the heart of the community. But I do want to pick up on, uh, on agreeing with you that um, perception, um, one person's perception is another person's reality. And I'm genuinely very keen to hear if there's any specific um, assurances or further assurances that we need to give. I'm happy to give the clerk of the committee my, my mobile number. I'm happy to follow up with Robin and Jonathan so that um, anything we're missing um, or any feedback that would be useful for us to hear, um, I'm very keen to hear it. So if you're happy enough with that, um, I'll do that. Okay, thank you, Antoinette. Fred, do you want to come back? Are you happy enough with that? No, I'm happy Thank you, Fred. Right, I'm going into the room here, and Kelly, you had mentioned first, and then I'll come to you, Andy. Thank you, um, and thank you, Antoinette. Um, I'm going to start off by thanks, and then looking back, and then looking forward, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by saying thank you very much for the framework that has been published. I know that it has been um, absolutely uh, wonderful to see that coming forward and the help it's giving many of uh, the sporting bodies. Um, I've noted in particular IFA and the good application of the framework that they have taken forward, and I certainly think it did help the golfing fraternity whenever they brought forward their own um, application of, of social distancing. certainly helped them to get recognition in stage or step one of the executive's plan. Um, my first question then is um, how is the framework being um, communicated public to all publicly to all clubs other than online and what has the uptake of the framework been um, do you want me to move on chair to other questions and then let Antoinette come back it would probably this? better if you do, do do as many as you can as many you back. okay um, just looking back um, I have to say Antoinette I shared some of the frustration that you you've obviously heard today about the hardship fund um, I've been an accounting officer myself and it has broke my heart whenever I've seen the number of thousands, to be honest, of applications that have come through, knowing that the majority of them are going to have to be turned down. I think this is where my frustration comes from. Um, the application process opened. It was for £2,000. It was a, a closed amount of money. I know you were looking for extra money on that. I don't think that that was clearly enough known by enough of the sporting bodies and the sporting organisations that needed to apply. Because the fund closed, and I appreciate the rationale that you've given why it was closed, because the fund closed so quickly and because there was no waiting included in that fund, it meant then that an awful lot of organisations didn't realise that you needed to get in very quickly in order to make that application. So my question on this is, would be, why was it £2,000 and not less than that so that the fund could be shared more? And do you recognise that in closing the fund early, and as if you've admitted, um, there is no way of knowing how many groups didn't apply or were not, you know, there, we know how many will be unsuccessful in their application, but we don't know how many didn't get to apply. And is that taken into consideration? And you've asked for um, support in future funding. I'm more than happy to do so, but I also have to be mindful of the good use of government funds, and I would encourage waiting to be used in future, keeping um, a fund open long enough so that more people can apply, and using waiting then means that those most vulnerable can apply. And then my final, um, I said I would look forward to my final question. Um, coaches, 
I am very concerned about coaches and how they are being educated and updated. They are likely to have um, child welfare responsibilities much, much quicker than schools will have. Um, so it's about the space of play, the maximum number of p participants that will be in you know, the sports and playing. Um, what and how is that going to be dealt with and how is that going to be communicated, not just by Sport NI, but by the bodies across across the countryside. Um, I, in my own area, have Ballon Hinch Rugby that is in trouble as an organisation and needs to get back as soon as possible. Bangor FC have been on. They are in trouble and they need to know when they can get back. And it would be really useful to ensure that any future funds that are available will allow those organisations to be able to apply and that when they do go back, that their coaches are fully informed of how to be as safe as possible, especially with young people. Thank you. Antoinette? Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Kelly, um, and thanks for your um, thanks for your um, positive feedback on the framework. Um, the framework was launched with accompanying videos launched on our um, social media um, a couple of Fridays ago, as as we know, and we had actually put in place a, a dedicated support team uh, that was available from that Friday um, to um, take calls, queries. Um, to provide high-level guidance in respect of um, the implementation of um, the framework, um, and um, we what we've done basically to ensure consistency and to ensure the right balance of responsibility and autonomy is that we're saying each governing body of the sport is responsible for delivering its individual protocols across the sport, and that. If clubs call us, we're actually putting them back in touch with the governing bodies of sport. Now, that's something we had discussed with the governing bodies of sport um, before the pre framework was released, that actually individual sporting protocols for every sport was going to be needed. And that's actually been working um, really well. So, for example, Ballinahinch Rugby will go to um, Ulster, um, will go to Ulster Rugby, who I believe have actually um, finalised um, their own individual protocols, really extensive protocols this week. Bangor FC, we would be putting them in touch with the IFA, um, who I know is working on extensive um, protocols as well. So we've had considerable uptake and considerable support for, um, for the framework, and it is being applied um, by all of the governing bodies in Northern Ireland as they take forward their own protocols, and our support team is in place to support some of the smaller governing bodies who may just need a little more support um, with bringing forward their individual protocols. Um, in respect of the Sports Hardship Fund, um, Kerry, I hear what you're saying. I totally recognise and we and share the frustration that we have heard today. Um, I think you've made good points, as has Jonathan and um, Robin, in respect of um, open, not closing um, so soon a hardship fund. I think we had to balance, as I've said, balance um, the need to get money out as soon as possible. Um, the um, the money that was in the pot and um, uh, uh, being able to manage the budget, but clearly there's learning um, for all of us um, in this, and there's certainly been learning um, for us, and we're happy to take it on board for the next um, for the next um, fund that's open. The other thing in respect of coaches, I will say that we're providing a lot of support um, to coaches at the minute. We have a series of online webinars and resources um, from our, our webinar, Wednesday webinars. Um, we have a Curious Coach podcast. We continue to offer online training development workshops for um, on coach education throughout COVID-19 and we're, we are again um, have given clear guidelines at a high level in our framework on social distancing as people return to training but we're also looking to governing bodies of sport to provide that leadership and in the main they have been um, that leadership and um, clarity for their coaches as they return. Thank you very much, Antoinette. Can I just say that um, the wealth of sport has been amazing throughout this pandemic, and I appreciate the, the difficulties people are having. Um, the amount of scrubs that have been made um, for hospital staff by um, some of my local clubs, including Ballycrown and Ballygalga, is just extraordinary. Um, 
and um, I'd like to thank everyone. It's not just the mental health of the players, but it's the mental health of the community that it's been helped, and we certainly want that to continue on. But thank you very much for your work and your team's work. I appreciate it's tough at this time. Okay, thank you. Andy? Andy? Thank you, Chair, and I'll keep my comments brief, um, as most of the, the issues have been covered. Uh, indeed, I do place on record my frustration around the fund, and I appreciate everything that's been said by, by colleagues and, indeed, Antoinette, and I thank Sport NI for their presentation, and, indeed, place on record my thanks to the various sports clubs and groups right across Northern Ireland who are doing sterling work, and especially the piece of work being taken forward by Sport NI around mental health. Mental health well documented uh, within Northern Ireland, the poor mental health that we have, and anything that we can do to encourage uh, individuals to come forward to talk about mental health is encouraging uh, and, and is to be welcomed. In, in respect of section 4.3 and 4.4, um, you talk about um, the work being done across government to maximise the support across, across government for sports clubs, uh, and in particular, you highlight uh, of the 402 applications, there were 83 who weren't aware that they were potentially avail, uh, could avail of the small business grant scheme. Uh, and I note that the Board 23 organisations or clubs have withdrawn. Are you expecting that to increase in respect of that? And also, has there been any scoping of how many of those clubs uh, the pending applications um, may also be available uh, to avail of that, that, that support? Um, thank you, um, Andy, for that. Yes, absolutely. One of the reasons why um, we're getting withdrawn applications is because we're working through the range of applications that we have already um, um, found were eligible, and we're in contact with those clubs to say, are you content um, to access the, the um, other schemes other than Sport NIs, and are you content that if you can access those other schemes and we're providing support and information on that? Um, are you content to withdraw from our fund? And that's something that's um, that we're working through at the minute. So we do expect that um, we do expect that to rise. We hope it does rise because some of the other um, um, funds available are at a much higher rate than the two thousand pound that we're offering. Yeah, and you're not able at this point to give any indication of potential uh, increase in the, that number. Um, I can't actually because our staff are working through the because they're working through those um, contacts with clubs. Um, it, it's literally changing daily, Andy. So I'm not able to give you right now um, what what the number is today. But I can tell you that it's likely to it is likely to increase. We hope it will increase in any case because it means we have more money to go around then. And just a final point, uh, indeed, around the frustration of the, the, the hardship fund opening and closing with, within 48 hours. And, and indeed, I would love to have been in a position that we could fund the, the full 4,000 clubs that you mentioned if, if they all required that funding. And, and indeed, if we were to give them all the £2,000 each, you know, we'd be looking at a, a quite a, a high requirement in terms of finances. Is the, and I know it may be difficult, but is our sport and I doing any scoping um, to try to determine how many organisations who may have wanted to apply didn't get an opportunity to apply within that 48 hour window? No, but it's a very good, it's a very good question, um, Andy. Um, I think my, my, um, my suspicion is that if we went out to ask that question, every club in, in Northern Ireland would say that they would have wanted to avail of it, and I can understand. Um, every club who has premises, basically, I should say, because this, um, the £2,000 was um, a figure, sorry, Kelly had asked me earlier, um, was a figure that we had actually sat down and identifying from our own experience of supporting clubs with, with, um, with facilities to um, what, what their overheads are. That was a figure that we had done some um, calculations on and was the figure that we believed was needed as opposed to 1500 or or a thousand or two and a half thousand. Um, we are current. We currently have a survey out in the field um, in terms of our new lottery fund phase three support, um, and we're asking um, some more specific questions around the types of support that 
um, clubs um, and governing bodies might need. Now we're being really clear, and this is this is important. And again, I have to say that this hasn't been signed off by our board, but there is a proposal, um, not just for up to three million pound of funding, but some um, expert um, resources which Sport NI is providing um, free of charge to a whole range of clubs, even if you don't, and, and governing bodies, even if you don't get an award. And that includes looking at new business modelling, um, looking at volunteer support, additional support around mental health and wellbeing. Um, these are all issues um, that um, will be discussed with our board um, next week. But these are the types of support that we're also putting in place. So it's not just about money. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much for, for that, Antoine. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. That's that's everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I just have one more thing. It's just uh, of interest, more of interest rather than anything else, and it's got nothing to do with sports um, and the types of sports. It's to do with the areas. Whenever we look at the breakdown on the dashboard, um, where we see, um, you know, the, the Belfast. Um, right at the very top, and then Antrim and Newton Abbey right at the very bottom. When I know that two DEAs within Antrim and Newton Abbey fall into North Belfast that I represent also, which are part of Belfast. Um, so it, it's just looking at that, and it's just asking, you know, did you expect that to be the case, that that would be uh, the percentages from each of those council areas? Or do you even have you any rationale for why, it, you know, we see from the very high to the very low? Um, there's a... There's, I suppose there's a range of um, reasons for this as well, Chair, and that um, we, we, we certainly expected Belfast to be high, just given where, where our population is. But some local councils, for example, had actually given rates relief um, to um, sports clubs who were operating out of council um, facilities. Others, well, others give some give relief. Some um, actually cancelled rent um, um, for the, for the period. So we would have we would have clubs in those areas that didn't need to avail of the two thousand pound because their council had already taken a decision or um, around around for example the rates and that. So that's why we might see a bit of skewing. I can't tell you specifically for answering it, Nobby, but I'm happy to ask the question and come back to you. No, I just I know I, I sat on that council before I was an MLA, and I do know that many of their their football grounds would have been owned by the, would have been owned by council. Um, so that could be part of the rationale behind that. It was just more out of interest than anything else. Yeah. Um, as I, I would have definitely would have expected Belfast to, to be up at the top, as, you know, with the uh, with uh, with the amount of population. But no, it was just out of interest more than anything. And just another, just a point on the the seven hundred and fifty thousand, um, which you said m much of which has come from those local. Kind Councils, um, but and I know that uh, certainly Sports NI uh, work alongside those uh, local councils when it comes to sports grants, which is great. Um, but it's just that it, that would just be another little concern, I suppose, where now we've we, we've applications closed and that funding that would have been going to specific councils is going to be spread out amongst the rest of those applicants. Uh, you know, there will be there will be people within those local councils that will lose out. You know, I'm thinking about you know the the local cricket club or, or bowls club or you know places like that that maybe didn't um, get their application in in time and would have relied on funding um, coming through three other streams um, so they'll you know that's not maybe going to be available for them going forward so it's just to bear that in mind also um, uh, it's not a criticism it's just a, 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 that, um, that that very much funding and I know a lot of the funding from sport and out of council um, is is for is um, you know very structured and is for certain um, certain things, um, but it, we know that the, the way councils are at the moment and the financial difficulties they are going to be going forward, that they will not have the, uh, the funds available to help out their sports clubs either, um, to maybe some of the extent that they have done in the past. So it's just really to bear that in mind. Um, and sure. just, sorry, go ahead. Who was that? Yeah, sure, jo Johnny. You're just could I just on the back of what you've said in relation to the final comments there towards Andy. In relation to some of the schemes that are being worked up with Sport NI going forward with future board meetings, etc., would it be possible to keep us as committee members as up to date as possible regarding those? Uh, it may not be funding allocated streams, but whether it's support packages in any way that uh, we can be kept abreast of that developing situation. On that one point, and on the second one, because I know Fred did uh, mention me specifically in terms of the characterization of my comment. Uh, I did mention, and I have said here, I welcome all of the support 
that clubs have given to the community at this time, and that includes GAA, but I make no apology to fighting for a quality of opportunity for all clubs across sporting sectors, and I just want that on the record. Okay, all right, thank you. Andy, did you want sure. to come in on a point? No, just indulge me, apologies, I know I said it finished. Um, just one final question in respect of uh, section 1.4 of the presentation. Um, you, you mentioned uh, off the back of the clubs, club survey project, you estimate there would be 3,500 to 4,000 clubs, and that's the premise that we were talking around, any uh, additional requirement for the fund. But you go on in that section to further elaborate and say that you estimate there could be 1,500 uh, applications potentially to, to the sports hardship fund. Could you maybe give us a bit of insight into how you arrived at that, that number? Yeah, it, um, it, we, we have done, um, we've done a range of work in respect of um, the um, picking up financial um, impact of COVID-19 and we very early stages before we opened um, the fund, Andy, we, we put out, a, it wasn't so much a survey, but it was a table seeking information. Um, around that, so um, it, it will be that plus um, a, a range of calculations that we might have made from the number of applications that come in um, over a, a period of time as representative from the number of sports clubs that are out there. So it would be unfair to work on the premise of the 1500 now, you'd be working off the 4000 potentially now? Well, I, w- I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to actually put a figure um, because I think if you and I, t- I suppose what I'm saying um, is, I suppose ironically, if we went out to ask every sports club in Northern Ireland, you know, um, would you want to avail of two thousand pound? I would imagine that the vast majority of them would say so. But this is back to the question of, would you want to avail of it, or do you actually need it, and are you eligible for it? I think you probably would come down to the 1500 um, figure um, as a, if, if we work through those calculations. And the reason for, for my, my question is, you know, there, there's a proposal on the table to write to the executive um, to support additional funding, and it would be much more helpful if we had an understanding of what that, that funding potentially could be. Is it the, the 1500 or is it the 4000 uh, It would be a lot, a lot more helpful. Yeah, and we can look again at as we work through those as we work through those sports. And we've been working with sports governing bodies to identify the number of clubs within each of the governing bodies that may be able to avail of the Department for Economy funding. So we would actually take those out of the up to four thousand, if you see what I mean. But that's still an ongoing process. But we're happy to do that and and, and get a better figure to the um, um to the committee. Yeah, that, that'd be appreciated. Okay, no problem. Um, sorry, can, um, I was just going to say in respect of the District Council funding, um, the additional 750000 that we have identified, 250000 has come from within Sport NI's, well, both, everything has come from Sport NI's current um, annual budget. Um, of the 750,000, um, 495,000 was earmarked to go into district councils for um, local community organisations who put on sporting activities under the Everybody Active um, programme. And we had written to district councils to ask if um, we could reallocate that money to the COVID-19. Uh, to many intents and purposes, it could well be the same groups. Um, who avail of it. I think one of the issues that we identified that funding was by the time that local councils actually administer that out, they open the grant scheme, they take applications in, they close the grant scheme, they then provide the, um, they then provide the funding. Given COVID-19, it could have been September, October before that money went out to those local community groups, and many of those community groups aren't actually operating and could not offer the sports services that we would have been giving the district council money to actually do because of the social distancing and stay-at-home measures in place. And so we took a very careful and conscious um, review of the practicalities of the money that we had already allocated. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we took that money because we felt that um, actually the district councils wouldn't be able to spend wouldn't be able to spend it, and um, the community groups wouldn't be able to offer the activities they offer every other year. 
Now I understand that, and thanks for clearing that up, Antoinette. I don't want us coming back to you in six months' time and said, why was there no money spent in not local councils? Yeah, as well. well, that's true too. Which we would be likely to do as well. So, yeah, no, it's good to get that cleared up. Look, can I say a, a big thank you to you and to Colm? We didn't hear too much from Colm there, but thank you as well for joining us um, and for, for, for setting out um, just what you've been up to the past um, few weeks and uh, yeah, understand just how, how difficult how it has been. Um, so thank you. Thank you for having us. Appreciate the opportunity to brief the committee. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Colm. Bye-bye. Thank you, now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Mem members, um, uh, I know during that there was a, a, an action um, of, of writing to um, the department and to the executive in general, actually around the, the money for uh, sporting organisations. Um, have we got agreement on that from all members then that we, we do pass or write to the executive about that or do we need to wait until we get more information? What do members feel? I'll go to the room first. If you any... Um, Chair, I think, as I said to Antoinette, um, if we are moving forward, then I appreciate how this hardship fund has come about. It was a very quick fund to go out. Um, it had a set amount of money and it closed quite quickly. But I think from today there have been concerns raised. Um, the waiting mechanism does need to be introduced and considered, and I appreciate that gives maybe a delay in some more money going out. But we have to consider good use of government money here, and if it is going to be for those sporting groups, organisations, clubs that are in most need um, who don't get access to anything else, then that, then waiting um, would be preferred with a fixed um, opening time for that. Okay. For the grant. And did you want to make any comment on that? Yeah, if, if I recollect correctly, uh, Antoinette had mentioned the, the June monitoring round and, and request of, of funding, if, if I picked up that correct. Um, so maybe just to seek further clarification from the Minister if any additional funding has been requested and if that's likely to be forthcoming. But I have no issue in supporting uh, additional funding. It would be much helpful to have a better understanding of what level of funding we're talking about here, whether it was, it's the, the 1500 or, or the 4000 I do appreciate the difficulty sport and I have in, in being able to get us that information, but it'd be useful if we, we have it and we can follow follow up thereafter with that. Okay, thank you. I'll go to the phones. Um, uh, any member on the phone, Sinead, do you want to come in with anything there? I'm most afraid to talk, Chair, in case you can't hear me on this bad line. I know. Sorry, it's an awful line. Um, it's just to, to do with the um, writing to the executive and the minister. Uh, around extra funding or, and, and asking the, the Minister as well, has she um, submitted anything for the June monitoring round um, to help with the, the continuation of this fund? Um, so that's all we're asking really here is just the, the committee's advice on that, the members' advice. You have yeah, can, you hear me okay? can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you now. Go ahead, Sinead. Yeah, no, listen, I, um, I, I have no issue with that at all, but I don't want to be sitting here again in a few months' time rehashing this the same argument um, in terms of eligibility of, of some clubs um, because I, I, I hear members repeating the phrase those most in need um, so you know I, I hope nobody's advocating that there is no eligibility criteria and that it's, it's a bit of a free for all so um, yeah as I said I'm happy enough to write, write to the minister and we'll, we'll see um, what her response is and, and what, what there is in the June um, monitoring round. Yeah, I think my understanding is going forward, we know that there is only so much money in the pot, so we want to make sure that any further funding going forward, that I think Kelly had said that there was, you know, that the, the, the criteria would be weighted in a certain way to help those groups that haven't had from anything else, you know. Um, so I think that's it. it it's, it's looking at the next cohort of funding going forward. Um, we can't change what we've, we've done so far. And um, so it's just looking at looking into the future on that, if that's okay. Yeah, but I mean, we can't manipulate um, the eligibility criteria for funds to suit, you know, a, a certain um, set, you know, section. So it's just to bear that in mind, you know. But again, I have no issue with, with the proposal that's in front of us. Great. Okay, thanks, Sinead. Okay, any other sure. members have anything to add on that? Sure. J Johnny here, no, just I, I was supporting what Kelly's saying. Uh, I think probably we have to look at the primary objective of the scheme, which is to support those in greatest need. That's what it says within the, the programme objectives. Uh, but I agree with Kelly. It's, it's the timing issue of how it was closed. You know, we, we do, if, if there is extra resource coming in and it is available, I'm, I'm happy to support the proposal. 
to ask for that and to say what the minister has to say and come back to us with. But we need to ensure that, that clubs that haven't been able to access funding from all different sectors get the opportunity to do so. And I suppose it, it's, it's a case that we can't change what has already happened or what has, you know, we can't change that. It's what's done is done. Um, we need to then just look at how um, any future allocations are done. Mark, did you want to come in? Was it you, Mark? No. Uh, uh, obviously, happy enough with uh, what's been proposed there to write to the executive, and then also in terms of writing to the minister about going to monitoring uh, round with this. I, I think, in terms of who who needs the help, that's important, but that's who gets it. And I'm not saying that anyone who's received. The, the fund, the sports hardship fund that it didn't need it, I wouldn't suggest that uh, for a second. But we don't want to create a new fund. We, well, first of all, we, hopefully the money comes that <laughs> it can be given out. But you don't want to create a situation where there's a new fund and it's someone or some organisation that's already received funding from the hardship fund can reapply and get twice and, 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 and some others left with nothing at all. No, we definitely wouldn't want to see that happen. Absolutely. Okay, members, are members content with that then at the moment? I know certainly during monitoring round, I'm sure there will be many competing um, yeah, asks within that. So we'll see how that plays out. And we have a briefing on that next week. So we do. So um, we'll have a bit more information around that next week as well. So are members happy then that we move on to our next agenda item? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Okay, members. The next agenda item you'll, is uh, uh, item six, and it's a briefing by Women's Aid Federation NI on the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. Members, you'll find um, the briefing paper at page <coughs> thirty-eight of your meeting packs. Um, just to say, members, there's also a separate matter from the Women's Aid Federation on the tampon tampon tax. Um, which uh, is in our tabled papers. Um, I, I'll come to that at the end of, of, of our, our briefing and our questions um, because that's not part of the briefing today. That was just an extra that was put in there, but I do think we can action that as well. Um, so I'm going to then ask, where am I? Okay, we've got Sonia McMullen, the Regional Services Manager for Women's Aid Federation and Sarah Mason, CEO of Women's Aid Federation. So I think it's over to you, Sonia, if you can go ahead and brief us, please. Chair, it's Rob, Robin Newton here. Can I apologise? I need to leave in about 10 minutes for another meeting. Absolutely. <coughs> Not a problem. Yeah, Not thank a problem. You. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair. It's, um, it's Sonia here. I'm going to hand you over to Sarah Mason, our CEO, to do the briefing. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, just to put it in context of where we are in COVID-19, stay home, stay safe. I've seen a message for all of us over the last 10 weeks. Just a note for the women and children we support, safe is not a, home is not always a very safe place. So just to put that in context. But just to say, my name's Sarah Mason. I'm the CEO and I'm accompanied by Sonia McMullen. And we're from Women's Aid Federation Northern Ireland and we do represent the nine local groups across Northern Ireland. Chair, can I just check, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can indeed. Go ahead, Sarah. Yes, okay, I'll fire ahead. So, thank you for responding to our recent email, calling to the committee to give us the opportunity to address you today in relation to the Family Proceedings and Domestic Abuse Bill, which is currently at Justice Committee stage after its second reading. Women's Aid across NI has campaigned tirelessly for many years for changes in our legislation in relation to, in relation to domestic violence. And we'd like to take the opportunity to thank members of the Assembly for the swift action in returning to the proposed legislation from three years ago. We are, though, really concerned that much time has passed and it would be very useful to look at other jurisdictions and how they have moved on and developed not only the legal process but also in relation to good practice. Women's Aid would like to highlight, highlight the omissions from the bill also within the briefing and what we would like to see for all victims and survivors in Northern Ireland to bring us in line with the rest of the UK. The extent of domestic violence in Northern Ireland is everyone's issue and concern, and with the introduction of the Family Proceedings and Domestic Abuse Bill in Northern Ireland, all government departments have an opportunity to move forward to have open discussions about domestic violence and abuse, because domestic violence and abuse does not sit with one department, but requires a coordinated approach across them all. So the role of the Department of Communities is vital. In particular, the Supporting People programme, which provides housing support 
for approximately 19,000 vulnerable individuals across Northern Ireland with an annual budget of $72.8 million. Under the homeless scheme of this funding, this has supported and helped build the capacity for women's aid to develop their vital services over the last 30 years across Northern Ireland. The current funding to the nine women's aid groups is $4.6 million. But there's also a real cost to this. The overall cost of domestic and sexual violence in Northern Ireland is estimated at $931 million. This is on the Stop and Domestic and Sexual Violence Abuse seven-year strategy. Just to note, women's aid funding is less than 1% of this overall cost. And we recently carried out an impact assessment uh, by CISA in England to look at the benchmarking of our services. And it showed for every pound spent on supporting people on women's aid, it achieved 4.42 in net benefits to the public purse. I would not like to know what the estimated of the cost would be if our services weren't in place. And, and I suppose I need to bring, why is this funding for domestic violence sitting within departments for communities? Historically, domestic violence services were funded through homeless streams. Women and children fleeing their homes escaped domestic violence for homeless. And therefore, women's aid could access housing benefit income, which supported refuge provision which developed across the whole of Northern Ireland, working in partnership with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. And over 20 years ago, in partnership, we developed a floating support service, e.g. this service allowed women and children to remain within their home, which greatly increased the number of families we could support. But more importantly, allowed women and children to remain in their home and children to go to their own schools. This was supported through legislation change at this time. But quickly to put it in context of the numbers, in 1819, there were 654 women and 421 children who stayed in our refuge. There were 49 pregnant women who went through the refuge that year, and 10 moms gave birth to their baby while living in the refuge. Not in the refuge with hot water and towels, I must add, but in a hospital setting. And um, I go to support 6,308 women and nearly 6,000 children access women's aid outreach different services last year with 159 of those moms pregnant during that support and across the whole world globally world health organization in 2016 stated that one in three women globally will be directly affected by domestic violence and it is a crime i know we're talking to communities it is a crime hence the need for robust legislation and last year the psni dealt with 31,682 domestic violence incidents. It accounted for 16% of all crimes. The police are attending an incident every 17 minutes of every day in Northern Ireland. And in relation to the Marek, this is our multi-agency risk assessment conference, this deals with high-risk DV cases. PSNI led with women's aid sitting around the table. We're the second highest referrer uh, at this conference. And two of the main actions regularly taken to ensure protection from harm is referral of women and children into women's aid refuge or potent support provision, which again highlights the importance of housing in domestic violence. And unfortunately, the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceeding Bill omits any mention of housing. Women's aid would argue that this ignores the fundamental issue faced by victims of domestic abuse and that failing to identify and secure ring fence funding for continued safe accommodation for women and children fleeing domestic violence will potentially lead to increased violence and harm and further homelessness. Any legislation must include housing. The provision of emergency refuge accommodation plays a vital role in saving the lives of women and children fleeing domestic violence, as does the floating support services, which supports women to remain within their home with a wraparound service. Housing is a major concern for many women who are thinking of leaving or who have left abusive relationships. Within the UK, domestic abuse is known to be a contributing factor to homelessness. There was a study done by St. Mungo Sheltered Lives that of their female clients, 50% had experienced domestic abuse. Further connections between homelessness and domestic abuse can be identified when one considers the mental health implications of long-term domestic abuse and the strong causal effects between homelessness and mental health. Deciding to leave an abusive relationship is difficult enough for victims without being faced with the possibility of making yourself and your children homeless 
as a result. In some cases, it can be the difference between a woman ending an abusive relationship or, unfortunately, staying within that dangerous home. Within the Domestic Abuse Bill in England and Wales, it clearly mentions housing and the government's duty pertaining to victims of domestic abuse and makes provisions for ring fence funding for refuges to be managed by local authorities. One did believe to be remiss of us not to insist on similar protection within our own legislation. We accept our refuges are funded through different mechanisms through supporting people and the process is different and that it must be treated within our own legislation. However, we believe that funding for specialised refuges like refuge need to be secured and it must rise incrementally with the cost of living. It is our position that this should be considered within the framework of any domestic abuse legislation implemented in, Nor in Northern Ireland. I know that was quite a long, long lot of information. I want to point out a few relevant points we really would like you to consider and address. The inclusion of housing within the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, ring fence funding for refuges, refuge funding derived incrementally within the cost of living, secure funding for floating support services, which supports the stay in tenancy, secure tenancies for social housing, specialist services for victims of domestic abuse must have secure, secure funding and domestic abuse legislation must reflect that. And also legislation in Northern Ireland that protects all victims must include women with no or limited access to public funds. And we also want to put out that we have a concern over potential changes to the system for allocating social housing. These points are outlined in more detail in the paper, and I'm very happy to send through the narrative I've just read out. But basically, happy to take any questions, and Sonia, my colleague, is really happy to answer. There's a lot of other omissions in the justice uh, in the bill in relation to justice that she can certainly talk to, Chair, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for um, thank you for your presentation, and thank you for the brief that you very detailed brief that you had sent along um, prior to the committee. Um, I, I suppose uh, we I had a I chaired a, an all party group last week on the UNSCR one three two five where where we heard about the the effects of COVID nineteen especially on women, and um, and we know from the various um, news that we have heard that uh, domestic violence or, or domestic abuse um, has risen um, over this period. And you're quite right that home is not always the safest of places to be. Um, so thank you for um, highlighting that again with us as well. Um, I just suppose I just want to ask, start off with a few questions just around um, supply and demand. Um, I was a police officer in a previous life many, many years ago, talking 20 years ago in Belfast. And I remember then that um, the supply of secure accommodation was was nigh on impossible um, to come across, and yet you have you've uh, in your submission told us that in 2018-19, 381 women could not access um, refuges because they're full. So it's just a, a, a you know is this still the case? Is this ongoing? Um, where the women are being faced with, where, where they are unable to obtain that secure accommodation that they absolutely need. Um, that's first we want to ask, um, just for a more up to date uh, on that. And then also around the, the, the supporting people, and we know that supporting people, um, because I, I sat on a previous committee here in, in Parliament Buildings as well, along with FRA, um, DSD committee, where we were very much of the opinion that supporting people, uh, money had to be ring fenced um, because it was it was vitally important the, the work that they were doing. So I suppose it's just to ask from that, do you feel that you're getting enough out of that from the supporting people? We do have a brief from them uh, coming up either next week or the week after. Um, so we'll go into some more detail with that as well. And then also around um, the secure tenancies. Um, we know here um, that after living uh, 12 months um, uh, in, in, a, in a housing association or within um, the housing executive, you're con considered to have a, a secure tenancy. Just to ask you, what more are you asking for on that as well? If you could just answer those few questions first for me. Uh, thank you. Well, if I can go back to your 20 years ago when you worked uh, with the police, as you can see, I outlined that when we introduced local support because we had done a major development program to open refuges across Northern Ireland and um, recognise the need for other alternatives. 
that tells women remain in local support. Just to note that those number of uh, refusals, and they're not refusals, it's non-available rooms, our refuges normally run at about 100% occupancy. We had major issues during COVID-19 because some families did leave and then we had problems in bringing women in safely without social distancing, which was a major problem for us. We put in a lot of contingencies. But there is... Are, are asking for more refuge accommodation, we believe that it should be the emergency for the high risk. But one of the other big issues that we have is women being able to move on safely from refuge into secure tenancies and into safe housing. And one of those calls would be that we don't always regard private landlords' rentals as safe accommodation for vulnerable women with young children who have left a seriously violent relationship and would prefer that they are access through social housing where there is a bigger level of support around um, that housing provision. In relation to the SP and ring fence, supporting people have been ring fence. I have to note it's been ring fence for the last 10 years at the same level. So there's been absolutely no incremental increase in relation to the cost of living. There has been numerous calls on looking at reducing and cuts and what are the impact assessments that I refer to that we commissioned by Citra, which is based in England, was based on the findings that uh, supporting people had moved and been removed from local councils across England and Wales. Funding had been cut or reassigned and refuges were closing. We were trying to stop that happening in Northern Ireland and are still very clear that to make cuts to housing provision for domestic violence is not the right approach at all. And in relation to the secure tenancy, quite often women do have to move out because that's their only option. And it is about calling that there is secure tenancy for women that are fleeing domestic violence and being able to go back to. There's a lot of issues there. There's also a lot of issues around women in relationships where there are bad debt, which has impacted on them and follows them through um, damage to the property. And also there's women that are getting rehoused and then there's Anti-social behaviour accusations because of the constant, um, what we would regard as stalking and terrorism that would come from an ex-partner. Sure, has that answered it, or do you want more? Yeah, just to, just to pick up again on the point to do with women um, who are, who have been in that type of relationship in order then to get um, secure housing through the social housing sector. I mean, we know that if someone is under threat of violence, they become a priority. Um, when it comes to uh, the point system and, and getting, getting a house. Does that priority diminish somewhat after someone moves into a refuge then? Do you, uh, is that an issue also where they've then moved into a refuge which is seen as a safe space and they no longer then become a priority uh, on, uh, on the housing executive then because they're not deemed to be in, you know, living uh, under a threat of violence in their own home? That's, is that causing an issue? Sure. In, in one respect, it is in that it used to be women within our refuges, and they still are. They're regarded as, as homeless, which would have put them up high on a housing list. The issue that we were looking at is that um, that their tenancy that they have is secure. That rehousing women after they've left domestic abuse relationships when they feel ready, ready to leave refuge is extremely important. And it is difficult for us to access accommodation. There is no general feed-in for women exiting out of our refuges into secure, uh, into um, associate housing associations where there's a clear, clear pathway that we know where they are going or how they are rehoused. And that does cause a problem. What we have done to try and alleviate that, but it does again hold it up. Quite a few of our local groups, our group in Antrim, Ballymena, Lawrence, Carrick, Ferguson, Newton Abbey, in Ballymena, they have six self-contained units, which quite often would be used as a move-on from refuge communal living into self-contained accommodation. Our foil groups have all self-contained accommodation, but again, they are there temporarily, and we need to ensure that there are other tenancies for them to move into, because they need to move into to get back to some sense of normality within their family life with their children. So I suppose it's the lack of social housing, the availability of social housing, and also maybe working closely with housing executives supporting people and housing associations 
to have a clear pathway for women in the exiting refuge accommodation is not a general person looking for a new rental accommodation. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. So far, I'm going to open up to members again, and I'm going to go to the room first. So, can I just quickly put yes, uh, head in another engagement. So, can I give my apologies? Uh, yep, not a problem, Andy. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, uh, Kelly. Go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I think that the the frustration that you have is something that we probably have all had over the years uh, with the situation. Unfortunately, we're left at this time with thousands of people um, needing houses and there isn't enough houses on the market. Um, I get your point about the point system and the banding, that we do need to do something within communities and housing to ensure that that's um, rectified so that women who are looking to move into their home um, following domestic violence are considered um, as a priority within that scheme and it would certainly be something I would support. My difficulty is that the presentation is regarding the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. Um, one of my concerns would be certainly we want to make sure that women do have safe um, tenancies that they can go into, that they can live there with or without their children. Um, and anybody who's coming out of a domestic violence relationship, if they're not able to um, retain their own home, that they have a safe home to, to live in. But I'm just, I, I unfortunately have had a wee look at the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, and I think it's more to do with the legislation within communities, to be honest, than it is within that bill. Um, that Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill will not, for instance, be able to force the Department of Communities to build more houses for domestic victims uh, or domestic violence victims, um, which is unfortunate. Um, and I'm just wondering um, what, where, how you think that it should be put in, um, if you could suggest the, the wording or the, le the, the change in the legislation that you want to see, because otherwise what I'm afraid of doing is it goes into that bill and it's not where it needs to be. It needs to be within communities because communities has the power with the housing. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could advise us where in the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill it would be. It's just given the fact that we're so different in our legislation, as you've recognised, between here and the rest of GB, or, sorry, GB, um, just how we can make sure or should we be working and concentrating on getting communities um, to ensure that the housing points are changed, to ensure that there is recognition of domestic violence when it comes to um, housing? Well, to answer that, and I'll answer it in, a, in an overarching way, in that our main concern, we welcome this legislation, is that this legislation was brought in to go into the domestic abuse bill through Westminster before Christmas until the Assembly returns. What was going through the domestic abuse bill in Westminster has a lot more additions than what we're getting in Northern Ireland. And this is our call on the evidence. We'll be highlighting major omissions from the domestic abuse bill in Northern Ireland that are within the bill in England and Wales. And we firmly believe that if housing isn't in, within the legislation of addressing domestic abuse, then everyone is missing out the clear path of the safest path where a family is safe if they flee domestic violence. When the police get a call and attend the house. Quite often he feels back to the house where that woman is. The safest place for that woman and child, child is in a refuge or access and floating support. So if this is not linked into the legislation, what you have is more legal powers, more legal remedies for women to access, but less support for them to access to be able to move through domestic violence. So, I mean, I would argue that it does need to be within the bill. And if the bill is there and housing isn't named, then what legal duress do we have with the Department for Communities to say housing is a vital part of domestic abuse bill and the outlining legislative changes to ensure women and children are safe? Does that answer that for you, Fletcher, or It does, but I think I need to go back and just look at the the legal powers on that, just to make sure that it's it's there. I'm, I'm just not convinced that it's within this bill. It certainly does need, legislation does need to come forward. I'm not sure this is the one to do it, but um, no, if you have any information that you can provide through, um, just to, to clarify that, um, and you have done some of that today, um, I would be appreciated if you could, if you want to forward that on to the clerk. Um, the only other thing that um, I was going to say was with regards to um, women who don't have, or, or anybody coming out of domestic violence that doesn't have recourse to funding, it's a very good point that you bring up about um, that lack of accessibility, and that is something that we need to address. Um, so thank you very much for that information. Um, it's something that 
of course we're all aware of, but um, it's, it's that recourse to services and recourse to funding that needs to be considered, certainly by this committee and by communities. Okay. Sure, right. here, would I be able to just yes, make a, ahead, a short comment there in yes. relation to um, Kelly's point? Um, I suppose for us at Women's Aid at the moment, our concern is that the bill is very obviously criminal justice focused. And, you know, domestic violence and abuse needs to cross through all departments. And it's not just sitting with justice. Um, and in relation to, there's many omissions that we are covering within our evidence that will be completed for um, the Justice Committee on Friday. And that's really looking at, um, you know, the, the statutory gender definition of domestic abuse. We're really campaigning for a domestic abuse commissioner, reforms to the family court and child contact system. Then, as Sarah has emphasised, the changes to the housing and homelessness legislation for those escaping domestic violence and abuse, the reform to ensure migrant survivors, you know, and people with no recourse um, to public funds for their action and support. But most importantly, there's no funding and resourcing of this bill, um, and that's really essential to be able to respond to domestic violence and abuse in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Kelly. Can I move on then to Carol? Carol, either. Yes, I'm here. Um, I think it does need to be named in the bill simply because, I mean, what you're not going to get is funding commitments in it, but if there's legislation there, um, you're, then the funding will follow once the legislation is made and it, and it has a statutory footing. And the reason I think it needs to be there is then becomes almost as a legal document legislation that's almost dry and disconnected from the lived experience of people and there will be an obligation so as many staff embraces as they can put on the, the protection of families to experience domestic violence and the better I, I also see that the fundamental review onto the allocation of points and our parties argue this that um, Families playing their home as a result of violence need to be considered intimidated and not for a given priority. And that in itself also questions the whole issue around security of tenure. I mean, I know even from COVID, from 18th of March, I only know of two cases of domestic violence out of at least maybe 25 actually reported to PSNI, and none of them went to Women's Aid or anybody else who went within their own families and community because that's where their family support is and that's the problem. That's why I'm raising it because here, here's enough for me. In areas that particularly in North and West Belfast and areas like Derry and others, that the levels of housing stress are through the roof and we need to increase the supply to reduce the demand. So for those families who choose to stay close to our family support, we're going to see a triple edge um, of barriers. So the more barriers that we can break down, the better. But certainly I believe that housing does need to be mentioned in the bill, as does health in terms of the psychological impact. Like there's a lot of recognition about the mental health and peer mental health that we all are going to endure coming out of COVID. I see for particularly for kids and families who've had to flee their home, often in the middle of the night, often completely pacified, and then they go into a strange environment where there's communal living and all the rest. It's just horrendous. Um, in relation to supporting people, it has been ring fans for the last 10 years, but it does need to increase. Um, and for me, I, coming out of it, uh, I'd like to see certainly the criteria that, we, that is part of the supporting people fund. I'd like to see what the outcomes, I want to see an outcomes-based approach to that fund. There's already been reviews done for me. It's going down the domiciliary car route. It's like an early rate. It's not a good way to go. It's the housing executive, in my opinion, um, got it wrong. Um, doing that, even suggesting that, um, and we're on the record as opposing that. But I do believe, along with supporting people in particularly, around the new decade, new approach, or an anti-poverty in the rest, that we need to ensure that with the legislation needed, we bring it forward. So for this bill, as needs to be mentioned, in relation to supporting people, it needs to be linked 
completely to the anti-poverty strategy. And for me, um, just to repeat again, we're completely opposed to the funding model that the housing executives brought out in relation to supporting people, bringing it down to an early rate because it's actually going to lessen the opportunity for more people to avail of it who need it most. And that's not the purpose of it. For me, it's a cost, a, a cost cutting exercise. And it's just so ham that it's unreal. So I just want to put those comments down. Thank you, Carl. Um, uh, do you want to make any comment on that? Either Sarah, Sarah yeah, here. Sarah, can, can, I make, ahead, can I make one quick comment? Um, Carol, really appreciate all of those comments. And I really do have an issue within a, a domiciliary approach on an hourly rate around supporting people. Just to add, Women's Aid is a specialist service. This isn't bricks and mortars and accommodation. This is actually vital wraparound support. And women and children that access our refuge and our floating support services are more likely to move on with building their life rather than actually going back and facing more domestic violence or going back with orders and protection. So I really appreciate that. And I do agree, if there isn't legislation, including housing, around a domestic abuse bill, it will fall off the edge of the table and we'll say we have all the legal remedies in place, but we have no money or support for the people that really need it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. As uh, I don't know if, if Robin and Johnny, either one of them are there. Either one of you still with us? Or are you both away? No, I think they're both away. Um, I'll go to Fra then. Fra. Fra, are you there? Nope. Okay, I'll move on then, and I can come back. Go ahead. Go ahead, Fra. Uh, no, Carl, Carl has said all I would have said anyway. Okay, no problem, Fra, thank you. Um, I'll go to Mark. Mark, are you there? Mark, are you on mute? Are you there? Okay, I'm going to move then on to Sinead. Sorry, Sorry Mark. Sorry, Chair, I, I was sitting there. Uh, Fra just said what I was going to say, that Carl had said it all. No, uh, just just to thank uh, Women's Aid for the presentation there. I think it's, it's very useful and uh, important that, that we get this information at this stage. You know, as this bill is going to be progressing through the Assembly, it's vitally important that we're as informed as possible about the implications of it and about the improvements that could and should uh, be made to it if it's to... I suppose, achieve the maximum benefit, which is what we all want. I'd also like to suppose, com commend uh, Women's Aid for their work and the work of, of, of others in the sector at what's been, I'm sure, an extremely and unprecedented uh, challenging time. It's just w w one question I might ask, and it's, it is in the here and now, and it was around uh, PPE, at, at your uh, facilities or, or shelters, you know what sort of access you had got there, uh, and uh, did you feel that the organisation and other organisations were adequately adequately supported by uh, the government and respective departments? Anybody there to answer? Sonia or Sarah? Uh. Sarah, do you want to answer that? Um, sorry, I don't know where Sarah is. It's Sonia here. I'll um, answer. In relation to PPE, actually, some of our groups were looking at recovery plans and getting um, our refuges and advice centres back to, to work. Um, so we're looking at recovery plans. Um, it is um, a lot of cost. Um, we have to recognise at the moment that we are the only part of the UK that haven't got any emergency or recovery plan money. Um, there's been every other part of the UK has got specific allocations for um, COVID um, in relation to domestic violence services. We did put um, funding you know, proposals through to the executive office, to the deputy and first ministers, but we we um, haven't received anything back in relation to that. Um, in relation to PPE, our groups are trying to source that at the moment for those direct um, services, but we are having um, a few issues with regard to being able to get that. 
Okay, Mark? Yeah, yeah, well, uh, I suppose it's incumbent on us all to maybe play a shout, not necessarily in this meeting, but what those issues are and, and see how, how they could be ironed out as well. Yes, some of our groups have actually just put um, please out on social media for PPA equipment. You know, that's how desperate we are at the moment. You know, you have waiting times to get even, you know, hand sanitizers and different things like that. Cash and carries are running out. You know, there's an awful lot of um, people needing um, all of the PPA equipment. So we are in the process of the recovery plan now and trying to source um, that equipment. Okay, thank you. I suppose just to make members also aware, well, because you wouldn't know of this either, um, the all-party group on Women, Peace and Security last week agreed to write to all of our MPs, all of the MPs for Northern Ireland, asking about the, uh, was it 76 million additional funding um, that, that Northern Ireland didn't receive any of that. So we, that all of our MPs were written to um, by the all-party group. Um, just to ask if, if they could throw their weight behind that at Westminster as well. So it's just to, just to let members know that that was also done. Um, can I just bring in then, Sinead, if you're still there? Do you have any Thanks, comments? Sir. you hear me okay? Yep, I hear you. Yeah, no, listen, I, cause again, my phone line's pretty bad, so it was hard to hear a lot of that. But just to say thanks to Sonia and, and Sarah for giving us that briefing. And, you know, women's aid... Uh, Women's Aid near Armagh, you know, our, our local service here is a vital local service and, uh, you know, is quite generally under-resourced. So, you know, any support um, that we can give them at all, we definitely should. And um, I suppose, you know, as I say, Carl covered um, everything that I would have said, but I think the bottom line is that we, we just shouldn't make it harder for women um, to leave a violent home or, or an abusive situation. Um, so we, we have to remove any barriers to that. Um, and that's where I would stand on it. But um, you know that that that's really it for me, Claire. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, Sinead, as well. Okay, members. Um, uh, I think then we just then have to make a few decisions. Uh, but can I just say um, a big thank you to Sonia and Sarah um, for coming before the committee today. Um, we absolutely understand your concerns. We see it within our own constituencies, um, and uh, we know that there is a, a major issue here. Um, can I say thank you for your briefing? And no doubt, uh, most certainly, um, I, I think if we hadn't had COVID-19, it's certainly one of the priorities for this committee was housing, and I know it was also one of the priorities for the minister as well. Um, so I just want to say thank you on that. And then I just want to actually, before, uh, as members, um, we'll decide on our way forward. But before we do that can I just mention then the tabled item that you had sent us through um, which was to do with the, the tampon tax and, and how Northern Ireland are not receiving an equitable share of that because, they're, because, it, because the, it falls under the one million. Um, can I just advise members or ask members, would they be happy if we send this on through to the, the Women's Caucus? I know there are various members of us that sit on the Women's Caucus and it has been discussed at the Women's Caucus. Um, would, so would members be in agreement um, that we send this uh, forward then on to them um, for them to, to, to talk about. Is that okay, members? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. And thank you. So it's just to let you know that as well, Sonia and Sarah, um, that we'll do that action um, from the tabled paper as well. So again, thank you very much for briefing us today. And no doubt we will be speaking to you again in the not too distant future. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Chair and Committee, for your time. It's greatly appreciated. And if there's anything further you need, that would be great. We'll pass it on to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nan. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, members, um, we need to decide on our way forward here. I know um, Kevin has just uh, informed me or reminded me that um, the Committee for Justice um, has a call for evidence is out, which is due to close on Friday. Um, so Kevin has said that he would be happy um, to draft a letter through to the Committee for Justice on all of these issues that have been raised today as part of our call for evidence, which I think it is, is perfectly acceptable for us to do as a committee. Um, the only other issue that we have is, is looking, for, uh, looking uh, towards amendments in the bill. I would be of the same opinion as Kelly, that it, it, it's possibly out of the scope of the bill. 
but of course that's up to the speaker to decide as well on any amendments whether that would be out of the scope or not so it's up to you members um if you want to pursue um that line uh, of of looking at any amendments in in this bill can i ask members what they feel on that chair can i come in yes go ahead carol Sure, I do think that even as part of the call for evidence, um, there needs to be some sort of reference made to housing. Um, well, I, I looked at the bill as well, and I can see the way it's constructed. Um, it, you know, it, it looks like the legislative piece in terms of the offence. But I do think um, we need to have some sort of reference there about wraparound support, including housing. So, um, but does it, it does it in relation to sexual crime and issues like that, even an exclamatory note. So maybe that's what we do to see how that can be fixed. Okay, so we're, we're all in agreement, definitely, that we put in a, a, a submission in the call for evidence, yeah? Yeah. 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 Okay, and then going further forward than that, then when it comes to the bill itself, um, is that decision we want to make today or do we, we, we look at that? Um, near the time then, yeah? Yeah, we can look at that near the time, sure. Okay, all right. All right, members, look, thank you for that. Um, where are we now? We're going to move on then to agenda item number seven, I think, yeah? Isn't that right? Okay, and agenda item number seven is SR 2020-87, Social Security, Coronavirus, Electronic Communications Amendment Order, NI 2020. You'll find that at page, the finder rule at page 40 of your meeting packs. Can I just ask them, members, have they any, any objection to the rule? No. No objections? No objections. No objection. Thank you very much. So I put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-87 Social Security Coronavirus Electronic Communications Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Move on then to agenda item number eight, which is SR 2020-89 Statutory Sick Pay General Coronavirus Amendment Number 4 Rex, NI 2020. Members shall find this rule at page 48 of your meeting packs. Can I ask then, um, have members any objection to this rule? No objections? No, no objections. Great. No. Good no. stuff. Thank you. I'll then put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-89, the Statutory Sick Pay General Coronavirus Amendment Number 4 Regs, NI 2020, and subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Can we move on then, members, to Agenda Item Number 9, which is Correspondence. Members' Correspondence Memo is at page 57 of your meeting pack. Um, can I ask, first of all, on the phones, is there anything that you want to bring up under correspondence? No. No, Chair. No, Chair. Happy enough no, with chair. that? Member Kelly in the room? Any? No, no. Okay. Um, I, I, well, the only thing I just I wanted to say, that mm -hmm. the, the response from the Committee for Health um, was very helpful, and I want to thank them for that. It was, it, 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 um, they certainly did respond well to what we asked. And I suppose I want to also bring up the the this the uh, the letter from Carmela, and I I would have loved to have had a briefing from then. And I think given if we were in normal times and we were looking at the start of a mandate and what we were going to do, it would be a great briefing to have. But um, I just I, I'm glad we'll just send that on to the department. I just wanted to put that um on record as well. So members content then as drafted with the correspondence memo, and we'll move on. Yes. Yeah. Okay, agenda item number 10 is the forward work programme then. So members, next week on the 10th of June, the committee will be briefed by the Minister on current and future support by councils and by departmental officials on the June monitoring round and departmental reprioritisation. And then on the 17th of June, the committee will be briefed on the COVID-19 funding to supporting people and by departmental officials on the reform of liquor licensing. And then on the 24th, the committee will receive an update briefing from SOLAS on COVID-19 funding to local councils. So um, can I ask members, are they content to note the forward work programme? Content. Content, sure. Content, sure. Brilliant, thank you. I'll then move the item, to, item agenda number 11, will it, which is any other business. I'll go to the phones first, any other business? No, thank you. 
Nope, Nope. thank you. In the room, Kelly? Um, I was just going to ask, um, I know that we're still dealing with COVID issues. Um, There is an issue that's coming up with regarding the housing executive. And I was wondering, as part of our future planning, obviously we've got quite a lot coming up um, over the next few weeks, if we might get uh, an update from the housing executive on um, issues that they're facing, in particular with corporation tax. Okay. Um, All right, okay, that is something we can ask for. But uh, you're quite right, we are still dealing with COVID or COVID-related issues in the committee, but yes, we can ask them if they sure. can supply. Yeah, go ahead, Carol. So that's been the executive new approach. We want to look at the historic debt of the housing executive as well as corporation tax. Yeah. But if we're getting a presentation from the housing executive, I'd like it to be a bit more robust than just that. I mean, the need to, um, in my opinion, bring forward um, almost an overview of where housing needs is that what they're doing supporting people as well. Um, but Kelly's right, the corporation tax plus is going to have an input or an impact on their ability to deliver more housing. And I, I mean, I would imagine that uh, sort of after, after recess, whatever recess will look like, um, we will, the minister will be bringing something forward after the, the housing amendment bill and the right to buy and all the various issues around that that are going to have an effect on, on the housing executive. I do think, as you're right, Carl, the housing executive piece is going to be a much bigger piece than that, which will require um, a, lot of, a lot of scrutiny and um, a lot of input. Um, so I would imagine that we'll start, we'll start to see that coming in September time. Um, I don't know if members are in agreement with that, but I think that's the time scale that we'll be looking at at this stage, yeah? Okay. All right, members, um, I'm going to move on then. If there's no any other business, no? Nope. Okay, can I, can I move on to agenda item 12, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. Our next meeting is due then to take place um, here in room 29, next Wednesday, the 10th of June and uh, the meeting will be at 1 p.m. Okay, members, can I thank you for your patience today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.